Okay, so again, we're looking at how soul making dharma and soul making practice can be used uh, to as an approach to ethics. Uh, soul making dharma, both in terms of the, the philosophy, the conceptual framework, and also the the nuts and bolts, uh, sensitivities, sensibilities, and capabilities uh, amassed and developed in soul-making practice, how all that can be brought to bear um, on uh, the whole question of ethics. And we outlined at the beginning of the, these ethics talks, we outlined um, seven or eight uh, kind of needs uh, that an ethical system, uh, that I felt an ethical system um, should have. Seven or eight kind of um, items on a wish list for an ethical system or an ethical approach. And one of them was dimensionality. And uh, we've started to talk a little bit about it, and I want to uh, spend more time talking about that today. That particular need, the need to... Uh, root ethics in some other sense of some other dimension, something deeper, higher, another level of being, something like that. And the need to have recourse to some other, uh, some sense of dimensionality or some other level to um, justify, explain, etc. Uh, with regard to ethical choices, with regard to ethics as a whole, why ethics? Why why this ethics? Why that choice, etc. And one of the, one of the ways I said well, well, one of the things that's happened historically is that a certain kind of dimensionality provided uh, by what we would call images, or what we have come to call images in soul making dharma, imaginal images, a certain kind of dimensionality um, given historically by uh, angels or daemons or whatever one may, may call them, as we still call them as well, imaginal figures, angels, daemons, that kind, the kind of dimensionality they provide as being intermediate uh, between human being, let's say, and the uh, transcendent, ineffable, uh, completely beyond of the ultimate Godhead the divinity of the Buddha nature, of the Dharmakaya, whatever you want to say. And that whole dimensionality that they provide just by being there intermediate. And we talked about how we can, how they reflect the attributes of God, of this otherwise completely transcendent uh, being of whom, or, or, or level of whom, uh, one cannot ascribe any attributes to a level of the attributes of God, the angels, the de demons, as refracting, reflecting, radiating those attributes of God, and our possibility as human beings, our birthright as human beings, to be called by angels and to also uh, learn to learn about and get closer to the attributes of God through the angels, and also to reflect and refract those attributes of the Dharmakaya. Remember that etymology of the Dharmakaya, a body of dharmas, a body of qualities, a body of attributes of a Buddha, of a cosmic Buddha, uh, one could say in the Mahayana, and that we can uh, reflect, express, manifest that through our relationship uh, with, with the angels. The images, but come the Protestant Reformation, their insistence, their central insistence on the ruling out uh, of any intermediaries between human and God, and then come further the scientific revolution and the rise of secularism, the steady, slow rise of secularism, uh, that we we are left in a position nowadays of needing to kind of legitimize angels, images, demons as, let's say, teachers or guides of virtue, of value, of ethics. So we've needed to put the whole thing in a new conceptual framework. Uh, 
that kind of takes into account and addresses uh, everything that has come between, uh, the, say, the Middle Ages, the medieval theology and thinking, the thinking at the time of the Buddha and uh, what we have now in contemporary Western societies. So that um, I can say, I can share, when I, when I did share uh, about a sense of praying to the angels, that has a, maybe quite a different sense than it might have had uh, taken literally, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago perhaps. And I can share that, and I can say that sometimes I can sense that. Sometimes I can sense that. I'm being very careful with the language here. Sometimes I can sense that I participate in the being of those angels. But that likewise they participate in my being. And looking more carefully more closely I can sometimes sense that I participate in their thought, in the thought of these angels. I participate in their sensing, in their action, in their speech. And again, likewise, they participate in my thinking. The angels participate in my thought. Sometimes I can sense that that they participate in my sensing, especially when they're sensing the soul. The angels then are participating in my sensing, and I in theirs. They participate in my action, in my speech and communication. Sometimes I can sense all that. And the whole thing has both a sense and a concept of uh, undergirded by the imaginal middle way or including the imaginal middle way neither real nor not real so neither real nor not real but yet I can pray and yet it is still powerful that prayer is powerful so the ontology here and the epistemology here is different and we've had to kind of shape that because of everything that's come between. Partly resting on a lot of what's come between. So I want to look a little further into this whole question of uh, this whole area or, or, or uh, element of our wish list, item on our wish list, need list of dimensionality. And I started uh, look, outlining four sort of ways that dimensionality might have been provided in the past. And I want to pick that up again, and pick that up again. And the point here, uh, just to be sure, it's not, a, a, which this is definitely not a history lesson, um, but the question is more, what can we learn here? What might we learn, and learn in the best sense? I mean, learn in terms of what does it imply for our way forward? What, 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 might, we, what might we take from that? What might we have to modify And as well, what might soul-making dharma offer to these ways, to these uh, possibilities of dimensionalizing, of, of uh, providing some recourse to some sense of dimension? What ways might um, soul-making dharma and that whole conceptual framework modify some of these attempts or, or, or ways of uh, providing dimension, dimensionality. So that's really the point. And so we talked about these four, and one of them was what we call what, what has been called voluntarism. In other words, uh, God commanded it. So why is this thing right or wrong to do? Because God commanded it. It's there in the Bible. And this is necessarily a dimension. Um, it, 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 it should be obvious, because God, by his nature, in this way of thinking, um, is a being of a different dimension. And so if God commands it, the command of God, the word of God, is automatically something coming from a different dimension. 
And that's kind of all the grounding you need, all the sense of dimensionality. You still be clear. There's a, there's a very clear dimensionality there. Notice here the epistemology. God commanded it. It's in, what, how do you know what's in the Bible? So the epistemological recourse, what's the authority about knowledge? Remember what epistemology means. How do I, what knowledge can I trust? Is um, a reliance on scripture. Now, uh, to some of us that sounds like completely ridiculous or archaic, but it's uh, very much there in the Buddhist tradition. And uh, if you, there are plenty of uh, Mahayana texts, um, certainly in the Tibetan tradition, probably in the Indian Mahayana as well, I'm pretty sure, uh, in fact almost certain, certainly, um, there will be texts devoted just to epistemology. What, how do we, as I said, epistemology, we need to base our understanding of, of emptiness and our process with emptiness on an epistemology. Otherwise, how do you, okay, you had this meditation experience, something faded, if you're doing it that way, um, how do you know you can trust that knowledge? Or you used your logical, analytical meditation and you saw it must be empty, how do you know you can trust logic? Um, these are all it need to be epistemologically grounded. And always in these Mahayana um, texts on epistemology, there's one category of epistemology, one, one sort of category of valid knowledge, um, which is scripture. It's just, well, it's in a sutta. It's, the Buddha said it. Um, so that's always regarded that way. To some, this sounds, as I said, kind of uh, completely archaic and a little, um, maybe even silly, but it's actually very, very common among most Western Buddhists. Always the recourse to, what did the Buddha say? And finding something in a sutta, but da, 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 and it goes back to, the Buddha said. Okay, so I'm just, I've touched on this uh, elsewhere. It's a sensitive subject, but I just want to point out um, in this voluntarism, what we're calling that, as, as trying to provide dimensionality, there is this uh, epistemological basis in scripture. And the Buddhist tradition has had that very strongly, hundreds and hundreds of years, and still alive and well, certainly in Asian Buddhism, and actually very much in Western, Bud- Western born and Western Buddhists as well. Um, And the ontology regarding God here is um, usually a kind of very simple, um, reified God. God just is. Uh, Definitely God exists. Um, Sometimes it's a more sophisticated ontology in which God kind of exists more than anything else exists. And very occasionally it's an extremely sophisticated ontology in the medieval actually pre pre ancient going from pseudo Dionysus, etc. Um and uh, and Pla- Plato in fact, um to uh well its roots are there. Um it wouldn't be with with Dionysus you get this um uh, uh, recourse to scripture as well. So it probably started ar- and then maybe Philo actually even earlier. Philo of Alexandria. It doesn't matter. Anyway. Um the uh, the the nature of God is beyond existing and not existing, and it's a quite sophisticated sort of negative theology that's incorporated. But usually, people who put a lot of emphasis on this just very simple um, voluntarism, God commanded it, end of story, about what's ethical and what's not. Um, usually, the ontology regarding God is very, very simple, um, almost... Uh, startlingly, naively uh, simplistic, usually. Um, Okay, but something's quite interesting about this voluntarism, because um, after the Middle Ages, um, from the start of the Protestant Reformation, something also was central in the thrust of the, the Protestant Reformation, and what they, again, insisted on. And Uh, a lot of what they insisted on was based in a theology of God's total and totally free sovereignty. In other words, God's sovereignty, God's power, 
uh, was completely unimpeded um, by anything at all. Um, God was free to make the universe any old way, in a completely irrational way. Uh, God could have said it's ethical to um, kill and uh, lie and cheat and steal and uh, commit adultery and not respect your parents. So he could have turned the Ten Commandments completely upside down, apart from the, 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 uh, the first one or two that are actually about God. Um, uh, so God is completely free. There is no sense that they, uh, what they were reacting to here was a, um, a tradition from uh, Platonism and even Pythagoreanism um, that there's a kind of order in the universe, a rational order, so that the whole uh, creation, if you like, of the universe had to follow certain uh, had to be ordered in a certain way. It was inevitable, inevitably flowing or emanating from the very nature of God was that the universe had to be had to be a certain way. And within that ethics uh, and the good life and virtue, they all had to be a certain way. So the Protestant Reformation uh, was, a lot of what they were insisting on was really based in a sort of really strident reaction to that idea. God is not... Um, impelled or constrained or trammeled to create the universe in any way at all. There's no rational order that kind of rolls. It's completely God's will, and uh, that's a totally free will, totally free um, power and sov- sovereign tr- sovereignty. So it's not then that um, uh, a, a, there's no rationality or uh, in the sense of a, a, a cosmic order, or a rational cosmic order in, in, the, in the first sense that we, I think we touched on the other day, I'll come back to that today. There's no cosmic order that implies or underlies um, ethics. It's just God's will, and that's a completely free will. There's um, nothing at all in any way that limits or constrains God's power. And so the whole thinking of the Protestant Reformation was um, thinking kind of partly from that very germ. We we have to think of God this way. Ockham, William of Ockham and people like that. Uh, And and following that. Nothing at all to to limit God's total totally free sovereignty and power. Which also meant, as we as we touched on the other day, there's no place then for ceremonies. For ceremonies to make anything holy, there's no place um, or to be in part and necessary for our salvation. There's no place for sacraments. There's no place for intermediaries, as we touched on. There's also no place for human action and human development to bring about salvation. Salvation is something completely God-given, completely dependent on the will or the whims of, of a totally free uh, God. Nothing you can do as a human being to change that. And there are no intermediaries, no sacraments, no ceremonies that can help, no development of character, no development of virtues, etc. Nothing at all to limit the sense of God's power. Everything completely dependent on God's power. And with that, as we touched on briefly, no ceremonies, no sacraments, etc. No intermediaries, um, no priests. Uh, the and no special human action. So no development, um, no dedicated, intense development in a, in a monastery or, or anything like that. Made any sense? Salvation comes only from God, and therefore, with that as a kind of corollary, with that there's this elevation of ordinary life. There's no longer a a better kind of life. The really good life is if you can become a monk or a nun and give yourself completely to God or be a priest or whatever it is or it's the time in church, uh, it's the time of the sacrament, that's the the blessed space and uh, something else is not. 
So there's this elevation then. It's like with with the with the, with the wiping away of any ser- place for ceremony, sacraments, intermediaries, human effort, human striving, human action, with the wiping away of any place for all that, then ordinary life necessarily kind of expands, the place for ordinary life necessarily expands to fill uh, that vacuum, if you like. So there's the affirmation of ordinary life, the elevation of ordinary life that comes um, with and after the Protestant Reformation. These things don't happen overnight, they're, they're gradual. That was there from the, from the start, right from the start. And Luther, uh, re, you know, cancelling his uh, monastic celib- celibacy vows and marrying, etc., and the whole Protestant work ethic, etc. It all, it's all tied into this. Now, the elevation of ordinary life might sound to us at first like, oh, that's really non-dual. Then you have a really kind of what we would in Dharma language call kind of non-dual uh, approach or view. Because everything kind of sounds like, everything kind of becomes holy. Ordinary life becomes holy. It's very Zen almost. Or some, some schools of Zen. But but it's interesting. It sounds. It might sound non-dual, but it's actually totally, totally, and radically dualistic um, in its theological origin. This, there's this infinitely powerful God, and then anything else, anything human beings can uh, work to develop or, or strive to grow in themselves, or uh, etc., is is uh, irrelevant. So it sounds non-dual, but actually it's, it's coming from a radically dualistic um, theolo- theological origin. And so, just to also make just a sort of side point, sometimes people think the Protestant Reformation was in in objection to, or in reaction to, uh, the sort of corruption in the priesthood, etc. But actually it wasn't primarily, that wasn't the main point. The main point was a theological point. I said, going back to uh, William of Ockham, etc. And it was about uh, God's power and not wanting to limit God's power. If we think about um, this idea of voluntarism today, um, you know, there are people in the world who who still think that way uh, from different... um, very many different religious traditions. It's just right or it's just wrong because it's there in the scripture. And uh, it's taken you know, very, very sort of simply and concretely like that. And there's very little other thought about ethics or other grounding uh, needed for ethics. And of course, uh, at the same time in our world today, you know, there's, there's I don't know, you know, billions probably of atheists. So athe- atheism is very prevalent. So such an idea as voluntarism, excuse me, to ground ethics is completely not not a, a viable or sustainable idea um, nowadays for many people. And as I said, usually uh, when there's this kind of, uh, when there is a voluntarism alive today, it's usually interpreted, again, through a kind of radical duality of human and God, and a kind of literalism. And if you remember back, uh, it must have been in the Sila and Soul talks, uh, probably near the beginning, and I sort of did a little exercise kind of comparing, um, let's say, someone who was a fundamental terrorist, a fundamentalist religious terrorist, uh, and comparing their their views, which can sound, a very superficial hearing, can sound like, oh, well, they're saying and thinking some of the similar, some of the similar sort of things that soul-making, uh, soul-makers seem to say, um, and just sort of debunking that by going and pointing out the, the differences there. So if you remember that, I'm not going to do it again, but if you remember that, um, two of the problems uh, with um, that sort of fundamentalist stance and the two of the differences from soul-making dharma uh, were exactly that, the kind of radical duality of human and God, which is not uh, really uh, entertained. Uh, it's very difficult to entertain that within soul-making dharma. 
context. I mean, you can, but it's it's sort of even that's within a backdrop of it's not uh, really radically dual. You're just sort of temporarily entertaining something that's really hard to sustain within the bigger framework of participation and creation, discovery, and uh, dependent on way of looking and all that. Radical duality between human and God and literalism are two of the main differences. So I suppose it, it, this voluntarism could be reinvigorated through an imaginal, uh, through the soul-making dharma framework and reinvigorated imaginally with um, notions of duty and, and things like that, in, in, as they are elements of the imaginal in our, in our framework. But again, you know, we have to be really careful if one chooses to, to play with that, because it really needs all the elements of the imaginal. All the elements of the imaginal, neither real nor not real, which is not not literalist. This uh, participation, creation, discovery, uh, you know, humility. Uh, we ran through uh, all that in, in those talks before in the sealer and soul, and it really needs all the elements. So maybe not impossible, but harder today. And certainly, I would be a lot less nervous about it uh, if, as I think most people. Most people, a lot of people, would be nervous about it, perhaps. But um, are nervous about it, perhaps. But I would be less if it had, if it was within a soul-making dharma framework with all, all those sort of uh, all the protection and the softening and the flexibility and the wisdom of the soul-making dharma framework itself and all the elements in the imaginal. Anyway, that's that's one we talked about, voluntarism. The second one we talked about, I'm taking them in a different order uh, tonight than, than last night, uh, w- was we talked about the cosmic order. And the cosmic order, um, the order of the cosmos being something that uh, implied and guided our ethical stance, our ethical uh, responses to life and our, and our ethical direction and our and development of our ethos. So you get this um, in Plato, you probably get it, I don't know much about it, in Pythagor- Pythagoreanism, Pythagoras, Pythagoreanism, whatever it's called, Pythagoreanism, anyway. Um, uh, but, but certainly you get it in Plato, so that uh, we, 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 uh, the, the cosmic order itself, once we see it, we can't help feel drawn towards the higher, using the lower elements of the order as kind of... Um, not really rungs, but yes, yeah, something like rungs, or we, um, they draw us up, let's put it that way, they draw us up to the higher, uh, towards the, the, uh, the, the uh, ineffable divine. So you get that very much in Plato and in uh, or Platonic philosophy, and then you come to someone like Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, and uh, it's very much influenced by uh, by Platonic philosophy. His, his Christianity was a uh, molding. His theology was a molding, really, of um, Platonic and uh, Christian elements. And so, listen to this. Is, so he, he writes something. Um, so now talking about cosmic order as looking at the possibility of the notions of cosmic order providing a kind of dimensionality for ethics, providing a sense of other dimension, uh, dimensions which can ground and explain uh, our ethics and, and, and uh, we talked about. So this is from Augustine, from his De Civitate Dei. He says, bodily loveliness, so attractive attractive bodies, bodily loveliness made by God okay, bodily loveliness is made by God but is never, nevertheless temporal, carnal and a lesser good it is wrongly loved if it is loved above God the eternal, inward and lasting good just as the covetous man subordinates justice, the, 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 the value of justice to his love of gold and think of someone who doesn't care about justice, he just wants to steal gold or, or get rich or whatever it is. Just as the covetous man subordinates justice to his love of gold, uh, through no fault in the gold, but in himself, so it is with all things. 
They are all good in themselves and capable of being loved either well or badly. They are loved well when the right order is kept, loved badly when this order is upset. Hence it seems to me that the, that the briefest and truest definition of virtue is that it is the order of love. So there's two, um, uh, two elements there that he's stressing, an order uh, in, in, in the cosmos in terms of a ranking of what's higher or lower. So to rank the value of justice um, above gold, above money, above getting rich, is uh, appropriate valuing. Hopefully most of us would, would tend to agree with that. Um, to rank gold above uh, justice, to pursue, to love, uh, pursue, uh, you know, getting rich above justice, quite common in the world, um, is, is the wrong order. We're loving things in, in, in not according to their order. So order and love, cosmic order and love go together. There's an order of things and there's an order of valuing that completely corresponds to that things and our love needs to be ordered with with those scales of of the cosmic order of things and their their value that goes with it so one interesting exercise would be to kind of um, consider how that compares and contrasts with with Hartman's scale of values and for example um, the transgressions that Hartman talks about of uh, transgressions of lower values being more grievous trans- transgressions than the omission or neglect or failure in higher values. So that if we fail to stretch or aspire to some really high value, um, that's not such a big sin uh, in Hartman's uh, ideation and notion than, than it is to um, transgress a lower value like uh, steal or kill or whatever it is. And uh, Augustine, in just that little paragraph of Augustine, Augustine is, 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 a, is a little too short because then we wonder again about things like, um, you know, how Augustine's conception will, um, would that eliminate the possibilities of antinomies at the same level? You know, what do, what do we do with that in Augustine's conception? Because there will be certain values that exist at the same level, or maybe he's suggesting there aren't. Anyway, that's an interesting kind of exercise. I'm not going to go into uh, elaborating on that, or it might be interesting for some of you to explore. So first of all, I just wanted to say, how do you hear that passage from Augustine? Do you hear uh, the kind of beauty uh, of the ideas there, or do you hear it as some kind of Christian oppression, uh, anti-physical, anti body, uh, anti-sexual, etc. Et uh, but uh, I can certainly, you know, I didn't grow up feeling oppressed by Christianity because I didn't grow up Christian, but um, uh, I, I can hear the beauty in it. There's something very, very beautiful there, um, very generous, almost very lovely in what he's trying to uh, put out there. This ordered love for things uh, corresponding to their place in the cosmic order and the hierarchy, and, and therefore their value. Um, but how different, you know, is our modern conception? Just notice how different is our modern conception and sense of the cosmos. Uh, you know, it's as only ordered by its meaningless and purposeless physical laws. We, we have a sense, most people are, are these days, of living in an uncaring, purposeless and meaningless universe without divinity and, or, or dimensions other than the physical laws. And physical laws are a kind of dimension. I said the other day and before, you know, the, the laws that describe... Uh, an electron's motion under certain forces are a kind of another dimension or can be seen as another dimension. The mathematical laws that describe an electron's motion can be seen as another dimension um, other than the actual material thing of, of an electron or a muon or a gluon or a 
proton or whatever particle quark. Um, physical laws can be dis dis discerned as another dimension. That's that's all there is in terms of order and dimensionality. So for for us, um, you know, citizens of and, and, and children of modernity and postmodernity, the only order in the cosmos is really the physical laws. That's the only order in the cosmos. As uh, Tom Caputo, philosopher, says, science is all the metaphysics you're going to get or you're allowed. I think his stance is very anti metaphysical, as was popular until very recently, I think. And that um, idea uh, came or grew as a consequence, it developed as a consequence of Descartes and Galileo and others and their decision regarding what is real, what are real objects of knowledge. We touched on that. So when we said this is the only thing that's real, then it becomes well. These are the only. This is the only way in which uh, the the physical universe is that the universe is ordered. You understand? They go together. If we just decide only these kinds of things are real, these kinds of things are secondary. These kinds of things are really, really uh, tertiary. So even color was something secondary because it's something the human perceives. Again, it's not an objective, independently existing reality like mass or length. And this was the thinking pre-relativity, pre-quantum mechanics. And they decided what was real. And then you're just left with a flat universe of only ordered according to physical laws. But Augustine wants to put love and order together. Love of virtue and order together. Love of things and the cosmic order together. And with respect to love, we do have strong feelings. We have strong love and strong eros uh, in relationship with what we sense as deep, high, holy, divine, as having another dimension. So this initial marriage that uh, correspondence that Augustine wants to make or emphasize re-emphasize between our love for everything. We can love everything. But we need to love it uh, in the right order. Our love needs to be ordered, corresponding to its kind of um, intrinsic value, which corresponds itself naturally to its place in the cosmic hierarchy, in the cosmic order, the hierarchical order of the cosmos. Actually, even if, just, just briefly as an aside, even there seems to be an order um, in, in reading the Pali Canon and, and the, the sense of the cosmos there. The word cosmos means order, by the way, from, uh, from the Greek. Um, but reading the Pali Canon, getting a sense of the cosmos, um, it seems a very different cosmos than most Westerners post-Enlightenment would would consider post Western Enlightenment would consider themselves or feel themselves, sense themselves, take them serious take themselves seriously as living in. But the Pali Canon cosmos seems to have um, different levels of being, divinities and um, it seems to be ordered by karma and uh, rebirth and transmigration between levels. You can be reborn in the Brahma heaven level and then in the this hell or you know the Vichy hell or whatever it is. Um, so these different levels, but still, still, there's a hierarchical order of a kind, but it's still, the whole thing is kind of purposeless. The cosmos itself is kind of purposeless, and not basically or overall good. And that would be a fundamental Augustinian and Platonic uh, notion, I think, certainly Augustinian that the cosmos is good and its ordering is good. In the Pali Canon cosmos, it's, there's, there's some kind of order, there's hierarchies, there's different levels of being, etc. But the whole thing is essentially purposeless and not, as I said, um, fundamentally or kind of taken overall, regarded as good. 
the cosmos is good, God's work is good. It's not really there. So we've inherited, uh, mostly from the West, we don't really inherit Pali Canon cosmos, most people, and maybe some do, but most people in the West... You know, when we think this is this is the sense of order we have in the cosmos, this absence of hierarchy. And then it's no wonder it's hard for most of us these days to sort of seriously entertain um, Augustine's sense of the ethical life. The ethical life is one um, that loves all things, but loves all things in an ordered way, according to the sense. Uh, according to where they are on the hierarchy, where the value is, and loves value values things, and loves the value in things uh, in a, in a in a hierarchical you know hierarchically ordered way. It's very hard to seriously entertain um, that whole conception. So if we you know in our postmodern and postmodern uh, predicament. If we're not already sort of fallen into its abyss, we sort of teeter on the brink of postmodern nihilism, uh, both in terms of metaphysics and in terms of ethics. Because we don't have uh, that kind of dimensionality. So thinking about, you know, this this uh, cosmic order as, as a possible uh, dimensionalizing and rooting uh, and kind of guidance for ethics, support for ethics. And, uh, you know, I think that um, even the vaguest sensing with soul, the sort of slightest uh, movement into a sensing with soul with regard to nature and things of nature, um, even even the vaguest sense of that, the vaguest sort of exploration of that, uh, can you know get a sense that something like uh, mass species extinction that's going on right now, species extermination, you know, uh, almost runaway climate change, that these are yeah, even the slightest, vaguer sensing the soul. One would have a sense that these are sins against the order of the cosmos. And that would be there because. In the even the vaguest sensing the soul, we're going to have some sense of the holiness of of things and the sense of dimensionality shading into divinity and, and, and all of that. Species extinction, climate change, could be felt as whatever the words you want to choose, sins against the order of the cosmos. Is greater than the sin against. Uh, the possible use of humanity, that if this bacteria um, in the Amazon or this fungus that's only found in such a rainforest or such a ecosystem or whatever it is, or uh, if that gets lost to humanity, or if humanity has less pasture land and less drinking water, even greater perhaps than, than the sin uh, to humanity of that loss or the suffering for animals. There is a sense of a sin against the order of the cosmos, something that goes so uh, deep as a sort of affront and pain to the soul. Of course, all three concerns, you know, the concern for the plight of humanity, and particularly the poorest in humanity, the marginalized, and of course, the concern for the suffering of animals there with their extinction and also just the way we treat animals, industrial farming and all that. Of course they're there, but there's something almost of a different order of pain when we sense that we are sinning, we are, we are involved and implicated in you know, this massive sort of un, unponderable, imponderable uh, uh, transgression against the order of the cosmos. Anyway, so so we can have uh, a sense of an ordered cosmos, uh, ordered ordered hierarchically like that. Very much we can have that sense in in uh, sensing the soul, but in soul making, 
uh, Dharma practice, we can also even deliberately move between entertaining any uh, kind of, uh, for example, a, co- a cosmology like Augustine's, a cosmology like the sort of a flat modern postmodern one, a cosmology like the Pali Canon one, uh, the uh, cosmopoesis can come first. We can just entertain a certain concept or a certain vision uh, and a sense, if you like, of, of what the cosmos is and how it is ordered and with practice. And, and you can just move move between that and see what opens up, see what happens, see what then the sense is. I'm putting an idea of the cosmos in, I'm putting a cosmological idea in, and see what happens uh, to the actual sense of things. And with enough soul-making dharma practice, and all the, all the sensitivity and receptivity and meditative skill that's developed there, we can actually move, if you like, between different cosmoses, deliberately and see what they do, what they do to us, what they do to the heart, what they do to the soul, what they do to the very sense of things, the very sense of matter, all of that. But going back to um, p- picking up what Augustine said, uh, wrote here, and he took the example of bodily loveliness, or bodies, and then very easily, you know, uh, we can... Or in certain certain religious traditions and others can be like bodies are not holy, you know. Um, he's not quite saying that. He's putting it on a hierarchy. But with soul making dharma, the question is whether this body, whatever body I'm talking about, mine or my lover's or whatever it is, uh, or or even someone who's just attractive to me. The question is whether it's sensed with eros. Whether it's sensed with soul, remember eros doesn't mean uh, is is way more than sexual attraction. So I can have a I'm sensing this person's body with eros. It may have nothing. To, there may be no sexual attraction in it whatsoever. But there's eros there in our sense of the word eros. So in soul making dharma, the question is whether this body is sensed uh, with soul, is sensed with eros. And when it is, uh, when there is eros in our sense, then then and that is allowed to uh, ignite, and instigate, and catalyze the soul-making dynamic and psyche and logos. Then there will be a sense of divinity in and through that body. So here we have again. Uh, this is so important. I really want to stress this. Here we have a sense of there is a sense of a kind of ordering and our love being commensurate and correspondent to that kind of hierarchical ordering in the sense of divinity. But it doesn't, uh, the the place, uh, the position of something, this thing or that thing or a body or bodies on that hierarchy does not rest in the thing itself alone, independently, inherently, intrinsically. It comes in participation. How am I relating to it? And when I relate and sense with eros, when I sense with soul, then the divinity is right there in and through that body. And therefore it takes uh, a high place on, on the hierarchy. It's not the thing itself. It's what's co-created, co-discovered in, in sensing with soul, in the relationship with the thing. understand? This is really, really key in terms of um, ontology and what, uh, how soul-making dharma is going to uh, or can approach this and uh, all this question of dimensionalizing and cosmic order as possible dimensioning and actually uh, kind of open it up or, or shake it up in a different way, reorder the sense of order, if you like. So let's, let's linger with that a little bit. And this, the questions of um, uh, dimensionality and ontology. Because grounding our ethics in the, the dimensionality of a cosmic hierarchy like Augustine um, is usually uh, uh, 
usually assumes or usually kind of subsumed in that is is a naive ontology. An ontology, uh, which still most people today carry, of independent objective existence. This thing or that thing. Personalities most people don't believe in any kind of cosmic hierarchy or whatever. But um, there's a naive ontology uh, assumed or subsumed within that it's of, of, of independent objective existence. This order, if we're talking about this cosmic order, this hierarchy has independent objective existence. And that, um, with the scientific revolution and then the Western Enlightenment, seems trashed, that whole notion seems completely trashed. How can a person believe in that, such a hierarchical cosmic order, as Augustine is talking about, after after the scientific revolution, the Western Enlightenment, after they got really embedded in the culture and they you know, developed within the culture. However, as we talked about many times, now, today, with the developments, for example, in quantum physics, with our understanding of emptiness, as I would understand it, and, uh, with the developments recently in Western philosophy over the last uh, you know, 50 years or more. All of those, or any one of those, um, kind of delivers or opens for us the possibility or possibilities of ontologies which don't assume independent uh, objective existence, but rather kind of um, may involve or do involve a more notion of participatory ontology. Particip- we participate in creating, discovering reality. So John Wheeler, the great 20th century uh, physicist at the, at the sort of forefront of so many developments and streams of development within quantum physics and general relativity and other areas of modern physics in the 20th century, um, talked about a participatory universe, or the participatory universe. This is the nature of our universe. It's participatory. And, and you know, let's make this really clear. It doesn't mean, yes, we take part in the universe. We participate in the universe just by existing and by breathing. I breathe in the universe. I breathe it out. I eat it in. I shit it out. Whatever it is. Drink it in. I pee it out. We participate in society by expressing ourselves and voting. It doesn't mean that. We're talking about what he meant, and we mean something much more, again, radical and fundamental. This subatomic particle, this so-called fundamental particle, this quark, this electron, this muon, this pion, this photon, where it is, what it is, a wave, a particle whether it is a thing or t- at all in, in any sense that we can um, uh, kind of really use the language of a real thing, how fast it goes, how much it weighs, its very beingness is dependent on the way we look, the way, the way it's observed. It's dependent on the observer. We participate um, in the creation of the most fundamental constituents of the universe. That's why he calls it the participatory universe. Okay, so there's a possibility now of um, uh, different non-naive ontologies that don't assume independent objective existence, but rather assume participatory uh, reality as participatory. Existence is participatory in this very deep sense. So soul-making Dharma practice um, both kind of leads to and involves, I would say, loving uh, order in this way. Loving what is sensed as highest or divine or whatever words we might use um, in the cosmic order. And it recognizes, it's based on um, this order, the sense of order, sense of divinity, sense of what is, let's say, highest or deepest or whatever, is neither objective nor subjective. Doesn't uh, we've gone beyond such naive uh, polarities of ontological thinking? So it loves order. It loves the the high and the deep and the divine and the dimensionalized. But it recognizes neither that that order is neither objective nor subjective, and provides also you know the the the, the training to be able 
to sense in that way, to sense the divinity, to actually sense it, to really have that impact the soul, to recognize it, um, through provides the techniques, the practices to do that, and also to feel, uh, to sense, to open to and handle the eros that comes with it. So all of that um, soul-making dharma kind of allows and supports both in philosophy and in practice. And it doesn't need to only transcend the object. Uh, This is just a material object. This is just a form. I want the unformed, the unfabricated. Yes, that movement and that possibility, I would say, is very much part of what we're including in soul-making dharma. But it doesn't only need to do that. That's not only where the highest is, in the more unfabricated. I don't only need to transcend, it's just one of the possibilities. And it certainly doesn't do away with transcendence and dimensionality and just flatten the cosmos or just um, kind of uh, assume the reality of a flat cosmos. Very loosely, there's a kind of historical parallel, very, very loosely, there's a kind of historical parallel to this um, with Arya Jaina. Uh, again, platonically influenced, influenced by um, Pseudo Dionysus, and um, I think he was a monk, um, Irish monk, and uh, quite a r- radical novel theologian. Um, and in his, in his, I mean, there's a very loose parallel here, I say, but so humans, he would say, are, are created in the image of God, which means that they can, so to speak, think God's thoughts. If we use our mind well, if we use our soul well, then the thoughts that we have uh, will will correspond to God's thoughts because we are made in God's image, and God's thoughts um, are the structure of the universe. This is a, again, very platonically influenced um, theology. So that if we use the soul or use the mind well, the order we discover through using our soul and mind well in the universe is, is just the order that God created and intended. A very loose parallel. With the sensibility of sensing with soul, we uh, what it does is it opens up our, our we w- opens up our trust for our sense of of the divinity in things, of the Buddha nature in things. You use whatever language you you like here, and that trusting of our sense of the divinity that comes with sensing with soul sensibility, automatically comes love and reverence towards that sense, towards what we sense as divine. Automatically comes um, ethics, a steering of the ethics, an ethical stance, and an ethical rooting in that sense of another dimension. But it's, again, neither objective nor subject. It's participatory. There's a a much more sophisticated ontology uh, recognized here. It's based on I remember um, when it must have been, well, certainly in the last year, when I was in uh, in the chemo ward, getting chemo in the hospital, and I was sitting next to a guy who also had pancreatic cancer, metastatic pancreatic cancer, and we talked a little bit uh, while we were getting chemo, and he, he was on a slightly different uh, chemo drug than I was, but essentially the same, and um, we both knew that we were, you know, in a process of dying. Um, his process too was quite, you know, drawn out, and uh, we both, of course, knew the debilitating and uh, limiting effects of chemo on the body and on the life. Really, limiting, uh, limiting very much what's possible with the life. So we talked a little bit, and um, he sort of shrugged and said, well, as long as I can still get around the golf course. And I was struck by that, 
Uh, not that it was very unusual uh, uh, to hear that, but I just noted that in his shrugging and the way he said it and the whole tone of what was conveyed there, there really didn't sound to me like there was much eros or dimensionality there. Yeah. As long as I can, yeah, it sucks chemo and I can't do much in my life, but as long as I can get around the golf course. It didn't sound like much eros or dimensionality. But I want to relate this to what we just said about order and objectivity and subjectivity, because it, golf might be, it might be, I suppose, an erotic, imaginal object for someone. But for me, it would be much easier, it is much easier to see football that way. Um, but, uh, you know, let's say football might might be that there is, uh, that can be an erotic, imaginal object. I could, I could very much... Uh, I can have that sense, you know, and there's dimensionality and divinity there, and even um, a sense of duty if one is, um, let's say, uh, plays football, plays golf. Uh, you know, if we talk about, for me it's easier, I can't quite see it in golf, or even, <laughs> if I talk about football, because I can see the beauty of really great football, soccer, you know, let me just startling, breathtaking sometimes uh, a really great football what human beings are capable of a sort of um, balleticism, the athleticism the gracefulness uh, with power uh, tactical shrewdness you know, the extremely quick thinking uh, just sort of, how does the mind do think so quickly to make these uh, you know, very sophisticated decisions and reactions like that the levels of perseverance, all of that, all of that I can really sense with soul, or potentially sense with soul, at times. Really great football. And there's a sense of it. This is refracting the angels. There's something in football uh, or soccer that can be, at times, and then translate this to, could be translated to any, anything, perhaps, that is somehow refracting the angels. So I'm just using football as it's much easier for me than golf, which has never really uh, appealed to me at all. But the point is, it's not intrinsically in the object or the activity, but it's in the subject-object relation. The sense of the angelic function of something, or the possible angelic function of something, and then everything that goes with that, that a person might, might have. So I need to continue with this thing, whatever it is, because there's some imaginal duty, or duty to the dame, or duty to the angel. And there's a dimensionality there. So it's not intrinsically in the object of the activity, but it's in the subject-object relationship instead. Now, someone might hear that and say, well, well, then a serial killer, for example, could claim that that was soul-making for them. But, but let's, let's, you know, again, bring a little uh, intelligence here and, and be careful here. Um, the soul-making image, the genuinely imaginal soul-making image, and for example, if one felt one's duty was to play football in life or whatever, um, the soul-making image, uh, if one felt one's duty was, yeah, we'll use an example, if one felt one's duty was to play football and that through that activity uh, oneself and others could have a sense of angels coming through, then either the, that soul-making image, it, it won't actually be football, I would say, or um, there will be a sense, with, if it is football, if the actual image, imaginal image, involves football, there will be a sense, there, a feeling that it doesn't need to actually be football. It's something in the image of football that one might have and have a sense of duty in relation to. Something in there, we'll say it's message, but I don't like that word, although it's related to the word for angel. Angel means messenger. Um, but it's uh, what the image is showing is something more general. So if it's a genuinely, authentically imaginal image that's making that's making one feel like I need to do this, and let's use football as an example, it won't uh, either won't be football that is the image. It won't be an image of football that's making me feel like my duty is playing football. It will be something more general. Or, if it is football, there will be somehow implicit in the image and, and, the, and the understanding of the image, the soul's understanding, relationship with the image, the, the knowledge will be that the, 
the, the, the duty is something more general. It doesn't have to be that. So translate that to the the serial killer could claim it's soul making. It doesn't really work. If the image does seem to be only football and seem to say only football, is probably not imaginal. It's probably a rarefied ego image. So if someone is getting images of serial killing and then claiming, uh, but it's only images of, of serial killing and the duty seems to be serial killing, it's not, not going to be an imaginal image. It won't work that way. But it would be, it would be a rarefied ego, you know, pathological image, not an imaginal image. So, you know, when something's genuinely magical, there there is this sense of meaningfulness, divinity, angelic function, etc. Dimensionality. So I didn't really hear that in what he was saying, but as I said the other day, it's um, completely taboo to say um, to someone there's a hierarchy of values and you're not really... Uh, you're not really paying attention to that. You're not really ordering your life in in relation to a hierarchy of values, or even to say um, there's a hierarchy of a uh, way of relating and way of sensing different things, and you're not doing that. It's not it's taboo in our culture, and this also has to do with. Uh, very much to do its origins lie in the Protestant Reformation, this kind of um, affirmation of ordinary life. Some things now seem unquestionably uh, you know to be part of a worthwhile life or constitute part of a worthwhile life or lay claim to be um, this this makes this thing or doing this makes a worthwhile life it is uh, it is the good life, the beautiful life. They seem unquestionably in our culture to be so often, but we don't. We don't often realize that it's historically contingent. So, for example, it was only in the 18th century, or beginning in the 18th century, only beginning in the 18th century, that sort of affection for one's spouse and children, which of course was always there. There's always been affection uh, between. Uh, Obviously, not every spouse and parents and children, but generally speaking, there's been lots of that. You know, as long as humanity has been around, there's been a you know affection for spouse and children. But it was only really in the beginning in the 18th century that it was then started to be considered really important, really one of the things that makes life worthy, uh, and that this is a significant um, constituent or qualification for a worthwhile life, a beautiful life. So it just came from this elevation uh, of, of the idea of the ordinary life. But as I said, so we don't realize a historical contingency there, and something has gotten entrenched, and, and also what's gotten entrenched is this taboo of questioning what makes uh, a worthwhile life, and whether whether you or I are uh, really living a worthwhile life, or orienting our lives that way, that, that becomes uh, socially uh, taboo to suggest that, to bring it up, to question someone else that way. Okay, so then historically there was there was I said this this idea, long standing idea, from ancient times through through uh, the Middle Ages, etc., of this hierarchical, uh, hierarchically ordered cosmos, and then with the scientific revolution and the Protestant Reformation, and, um, uh, there there was a collapse of any kind, uh, or for large segments of the population, there was, you know, one couldn't really entertain that idea anymore. And what there was instead um, was an emphasis on order in the universe, but it wasn't hierarchical. 
as uh, Plato and Augustine would have it. So moral philosophers like Locke and Hutcheson also um, emphasised order, the order of the universe, but not a hierarchical order. The order they were talking about and tried to invoke as uh, a support for a, a kind of dimensionalizing another dimension, a support in another dimension for ethics, uh, was a much more Cartesian order from Descartes, this idea of the universe as a clockwork of interlocking parts um, that was designed by God to, uh, you know, to work in a way, these, these parts of the mechanism, um, for, the, for the mutual preservation and flourishing of, uh, I think, human beings. But I'll come back to that. Uh, and again, I have this question of what flourishing means. So that's also um, very contingent on the philosophy and the sense of dimensionality and all these things are tied together. But basically what we have here is an order that's horizontal and flat and not dimensional. There's not a hierarchical order there's just a flat order of the cosmos. And with that goes an idea of um, good, of moral good, of the good life, as being only only happiness or pleasant sensations. Okay, So the good life um, and the beautiful life is not one which is directed towards the highest, oriented, let's say, upwards, on the scale, on the rungs, on the staircase of the cosmic order. But it's only, uh, what, what is good is only pleasant sensations and happiness. And this was uh, claimed to be a result of naturally, I'll put that in inverted commas, a natural observation of biological and physical systems. This is what... Um, you know, human beings want, maybe animals too, only happiness or pleasant sensations. Jeremy Bentham, the sort of was regarded as the sort of father of utilitarianism, is basically that's the philosophy we're only interested in happiness and pleasant sensations. I'll come back to that. But he said, um, or wrote, wanting anything higher than just simple, you know, pleasant pleasure and pleasant sensations, natural pleasant sensations of the body, etc., and happiness. Wanting anything higher is just pride. Or it comes from superstitious fear. So again, um, we talked about Charles Taylor commenting that a lot of these kinds of philosophies were parasitic. And when Bentham wrote or said that, and wanting anything higher in life is just pride or, or superstitious fear, as, as it's uh, motivated by pride. You want to think you're better than you are, you want to think human beings are better than they are, or superstitious fear of being punished or something like that by God. And uh, Charles Taylor points out that this... Um, is this idea that Bentham said, this uh, kind of rhetoric and judgment that, of Bentham there is actually parasitic on the Protestant Reformation's um, uh, you know, well-established kind of ethic of ordinary life. So this elevation of ordinary life, this um, affirmation of ordinary life had already become well-established versus any kind of hierarchical ethics with regard to virtues and values. So Bentham could say something quite polemic like that, but it was already resting on a kind of well-established ethic of ordinary life. You could say, don't try and rise above gross sense pleasures. So there's a shift in order from vertical to horizontal, and with the view of the horizontal order comes also a kind of flattening of... Um, what the goal is of ethics, what we need to take care of um, in society, but also what we need to aim for in ourselves, what we should be aiming for in ourselves. Nothing high, just pleasant sensations, just simple happiness, natural happiness. So this is quite interesting, I think. This is very interesting. And 
you know, post the Reformation, there's, there was so much, there was so much kind of often really quite vitriolic um, rejection of, for example, asceticism and high and of high moral goals. Um, for example, the ones you know what would be espoused by some really devoted uh, religious or spiritual practitioners. There was really a, a quite quite um, scathing rejection of asceticism and high moral goals. Now, some of that, of course, was related to this elevation affirmation of ordinary life, and this uh, um, de-dimensionalizing of the hierarchical cosmic order. But some of it, for example, coming from uh, Montaigne or Hume, um, came more from a kind of psychology where there's like, ah, oh, I need to give myself a break from these high moral standards and this pushing myself and this striving to be good and to, to striving towards high virtues. So the, the thrust in Montaigne and Hume is often, um, give, my, give me a break. Don't be proud. Get real, real about what a human being is and what a, what a human being should strive for and the capacities there. And uh, th- th- that attitude is very common today as well. And you can hear it in a lot of Dharma voices as well. And there's a kind, sometimes it goes with a kind of despising of uh, what is lofty, a kind of despising of what is noble. I'm using the word noble as in aspiring highly, with with the dignity of aspiring to high high virtues and what's in beyond reach. Not, I'm not using noble right now in, in, in Hartman's way of using it that we talked about in Sina and Soul. So I wonder actually quite what's going on here. And I wonder if, in fact, that whole attitude reflects an anti-libidinal stance reflects a refusal of Eros. We talked about this, I'm pretty sure it was in the Eros Unfettered talks, but it might have been in, 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 in another series. Actually, is my philosophy, my dharma, my ethical thinking, my ethical philosophy and practice, my whole life, is it actually driven by a, a refusal of Eros and a kind of anti-libidinality? Fear of libidinality or, 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 or a, you know, imposition of a limit on it? Or is it held, and this whole philosophy, in a very limited range of eros and libido? Someone who holds this kind of view doesn't like the idea of uh, the, the very lofty striving, doesn't uh, like the sort of noble, despises it in some way as more, give myself a break, get real, Don't be proud. Sometimes such a person is, uh, you know, very friendly, relatively warm, they enjoy socializing, they enjoy a glass of good wine with a good meal. But all of that, the friendliness, the relative warmth, the, you know, enjoying socializing, the wine and the good meal, that's not what we call eros. That's not what we call eros. You can have all that, and it looks like, well, oh, the person's living, and they're, not, you know, enjoying company, and they're enjoying interaction with human beings, and they're warm, and they're enjoying, you know, simple pleasures of life, food, and good food, good wine, whatever, in moderation. But there can still be all that, and it's held within anti-libidinality. The, the striving ascetic who, you know, may be li- living in solitude um, or seeking out solitude, who doesn't um, go for the good wine, etc., seems a little aloof, maybe. The striving ascetic may have much more eros, much more libido. So I wonder, sometimes at least, is it actually this that they're objecting to, that they're shrinking from, that they're uncomfortable with? the eros and the libido that go with um, lofty uh, aspirations, moral aspirations, and the elevation of that, or or the striving towards what is elevated. Is it actually 
an objection to, a, a recoiling from, a fear of the eros and the libido, a refusal of that that's driving things. So that's, that's to me, a really, a really important question. Again, what's the psychology, what's the soul style that underlies, uh, in, in this case, the ethical style, or the picture of the Dharma, the range of the Dharma, the vision of awakening? We talked about this before. There's something particular about an anti, anti-libidinal stances. Anti-libidinal... Positions of soul, or uh, imprisonments of soul. Because if the soul loves soul making, if that's a sort of axiomatic principle, the soul loves soul making. It must, it must love eros and be okay with eros in order to let the soul making, in order for soul making to happen. Because soul making needs eros. So an anti libidinality is kind of a locking of the soul, preventing it or limiting the range of its soul making, and therefore limiting the range of what it can sense and what it can view, how it can conceive, and how it conceives whatever ethics, dharma, human existence, etc. So that's one thing I'm wondering about. But also, the second thing, very importantly as well, is that um, with a soul making dharma. Uh, approach to ethics, um, then there isn't an insistence on an absolute material standard or demand regarding um, ethics and virtues. It's uh, rather only a kind of soul-making dharma really is, uh, only gives us a kind of hands us a kind of request or invitation to a process, to a practice, to a training in uh, approaching questions of ethics and ethical situations. So, um, and that training, I would say, is not more difficult than either Montaigne or Hume's trainings in philosophy, in literature, in introspection. Both of them are, some some people regard uh, both of them or one of them as uh, you know, great introspectionists, masters of the art of introspection. So it's not um, that ethics imposes an absolute material standard or demand. It's an invitation to a process, a practice that brings a different relationship with the things of the world and and different ethical uh, inactions, virtues, etc. But you can um, get a sense with all this of how there is perhaps a suppression, or at least the absence, the disallowing of eros and love. Maybe a total suppression, or you know, partial suppressing of eros and love in relation to ethics, in relation to values and virtues. So if we think about... Um, Actually, thing. you know, um, Francis Bacon was, I think, a Puritan, certainly very influenced by Puritanism. Um, and the whole, you know, he, he's one of the philosophers who, who was regarded as really, em- you know, we can see historically, he really emphasized the sort of instrumental stance. Science, uh, knowledge needs to give us power, power over nature, power to do, power to make this work, technology. And uh, it's just worth pointing out that originally there was, you know, a, a real religious reasoning and motivation behind this instrumental stance. And I said he, he was very, he was a Puritan, or certainly very influenced by that Puritan outlook. So science is, uh, in this view, um, the correct and God-willed view and use of things. 
correct, um, also because it brings uh, human dignity of having rational control. That rational control over things and in relation to things uh, gives a human being dignity. But it's also the correct and God-willed view and, and use of, thing, of the things of the world for our preservation and for our pleasure and happiness. So that the instrumental stance was seen as, um, initially, still religious, religiously rooted. An instrumental stance, um, meaning how we, we approach the things of the world, uh, how can we use them, make them part of our technology, technologize them. It's, the instrumental stance originally was part of the way we serve God in creation, by preserving ourselves and by preserving God's horizontal order. And there's also the injunction there to treat things as instruments, not as ends in themselves. So you can hear the kind of puritanical tenor of that. Um, I just want to briefly read something. Um, Again, Charles Taylor writing about this is... um, Uh, the instrumental stance in modern culture is supported not just by the new science, that's the scientific revolution, not just by the dignity attaching to disengage rational control. It was also central to the ethic of ordinary life from its theological origins On, onwards. As I'll explain, as time went by, the, the, the theological origins got forgotten and, and the, the whole theology got Uh, jettisoned from all this. But it was central to the ethic of ordinary life from its theological origins on. Affirming ordinary life has meant valuing the efficacious control of things by which it is preserved and enhanced, as well as valuing the detachment from purely personal enjoyments which would blunt our dedication to its general flourishing. This was um, the religious puritanically influenced um, uh, emergence of the idea of the instrumental stance in relationship and in the context of horizontal um, order that God designed. But then what we have, um, when the, when the vertical order is uh, abolished and a horizontal order takes primary place in, 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 the, in the cosmology, in the view of things, then that horizontal order is not an order of um, divine signs, of divine forms and ideas. Rather, um, we're talking about an order. So, so in other words, um, it's not that this thing or that event uh, or that person is a refraction of an angel, a sign, uh, a theophany of an angel, an expression, a manifestation, or an attribute of God, etc. That's all gone. Rather, the order that we're talking about is parts of a machine. Things become not that, not diaphanous reflections and refractions of, of particular aspects of divinity, particular attributes of the Dharmakaya, the Buddha nature of the divine. Rather, they become parts of a machine whose parts work together to bring about God's plan. It's quite a different view. So this cosmic order is just, again, it's just one dimension. It's what we might call horizontal. It's a clockwork kind of ecosystem view. And it's horizontal, if we think about an ecosystem, it's still horizontal in the way most people think about it these days. Still might have, you know, the top of the food chain is whatever, this animal or whatever. But there's no difference of dimensionality, even though we could draw a food chain. Between the bottom and the top of the food chain, there's no difference of dimensionality there. There's only a qualitative difference in terms of, you know, who we to and how much. So the whole thing's actually horizontal, the way we think about um, interconnectedness these days and ecosystems. The cosmic order is just this one-dimensional, horizontal kind of clockwork machine. And if that's the case, if that's the view, 
then something like species extinction is not really a problem unless it affects the functioning of the ecosystem. Unless it, a function, unless it affects the functioning of the whole, unless the function of the whole is impaired, unless the working of the clock is um, affected in a way that is problematic enough for us as humans, because of our investment and our dependence, or uh, is problematic for, um, for large other parts of the mechanism. In other words, the whole mechanism itself might be impaired. So the reverence there for order is not reverence in a kind of soul or religious sense. It's a kind of marvelling, perhaps, at the intricacy of the, uh, the web of life. The web, uh, the, or the horizontal order of the cosmos. Whether that's regarded as being designed by God or just evolved um, purely materially without God. It's not reverence in the way that we would uh, use that term. It's the whole mechanism's functioning that is important, ra uh, rather than each of the individual elements being holy just because they are, uh, just because they're connected to, they're related to the divine through their places in the order, as they would be in, in a hierarchical ordered cosmos. Each thing a sign, a theophany, a showing. Of one or, or other of the attributes of God, each expressing an attribute, an aspect, a quality of the Buddha nature, of the Dharmakaya, of what in Platonic terms are the intelligences, the thoughts of God, each thing a sign, a form, a refraction, an expression of that. You think about species extinction and a horizontal view of the cosmos. It only matters if it, either that it affects us when we lose that species, like the bees. People often say, oh, if the bees go, then the pollination will go and we'll go hungry. But isn't there something else about the, in our care for the bees and the, and the plight of the bees as a species, as species? Something of a sense of their uh, necessity, their beauty. And that beauty has, has a, a dimensionality and depth as talked about before when we talked about beauty in, in other talks and other series. So in a, in a hierarchically ordered cosmos, each thing um, has its value, has its place, and it's, it is a refraction of God, of the divine. But in a horizontal cosmos, yeah, we can lose this species, that species, and that whole thing, as long as it doesn't affect the whole ecosystem or us. And note also how totally anthropocentric uh, was the view and concern of those who kind of promulgate, promulgated uh, this horizontalizing of the cosmic order in, when it first uh, emerged and its relation with ethics. Adam Smith, John Locke, Jeremy Bentham. This idea of everyone's happiness being uh, prioritized but who's the everyone? It's very anthropocentric. Actually, it was even more, more circumscribed than that, I would say. But anyway. Um, okay, so there's uh, voluntarism. There's the, the uh, notion of cosmic order in different ways that can give dimensionality and underpinning to ethics. And, and we talked about how in soul-making dharma might... Uh, come in and, and modify, support, uh, or, you know, different versions of that. Rationality was another one we mentioned. So, rationality as a kind of dimensionality. 
Um, for someone like Kant, Immanuel Kant, rationality, which was very, for him, connected with morality and our freedom, were they're just facets of the same thing for him. But to be rational was more important than to be happy and to have pleasure. So right there, you, can, you sense this, uh, he's establishing a dimensionality, a dimensionality and rationality. Rationality is more important than to, to, to be happy or, or to have pleasurable feelings. So rationality as an as a, a attempt or a way of providing uh, dimensionality for ethics. And, a, and an ability to, you know, what's, again, what, what are we going to root our ethics in? What are we going to have recourse to? What is it going to be supported by? It needs to be made sense of by, in another dimension, by its relationship with another dimension, by the implications streaming from another dimension. And so one of them could be just rationality as it was for Kant. Um, now, rationality in, in the usual way that we would understand it this way is just our ability to think clearly, our ability to make conclusions, deductions, etc., our ability to be logical. That as an underpinning of ethics, as a dimensionality of ethics, that, you know, um, human, well, presumed human, merely human capacity to do that. Um, but rationality as we conceive it in, in that way is, is actually a kind of skill. Um, unless we're just following a rule that's devised or discovered, rational rule that's devised or discovered by someone else, then for us to be rational is actually we're relying on a skill that we have developed as human beings, a part that we've been taught in school, etc. And think, okay, that's interesting. If you want to make that a dimension, and then comparing with soul-making practice, isn't discerning soulfulness, or discerning whether something is uh, soul-making, whether this sense of virtue is more soul-making than that, that, that value is more soul-making than that, or that... Ethic, uh, discerning the soul making and the soulfulness in regard to an image um, is also a skill. I think most people would think, in your know, first reaction on such a thought, yeah, but you know, soul making, the skill in soul making is much, much harder to develop than a skill in logical thinking, in rationality. That would be that was my first thought, but then I then I thought, well, maybe that's just because of what's what we've been, how we've been educated. That that's the norm that we're taught um, from an early age. Um, and there's a great deal of emphasis in our culture placed on being able to think clearly, rationally, etc. In that sense, so that becomes the norm, and therefore that seems to us much. I'm not sure if this is right, but is it that it's just an education thing? That it seems much easier um, to use our rational intellect in our culture. It seems much easier than to kind of learn all the subtleties and sophistications of soul-making dharma practice. I'm not sure. It's really a question. But it's interesting to note that John Locke uh, was um, also sceptical. So he was a you know, big promoter of human rationality, uh, this capacity to function and use our uh, thinking mind um, as a basis for ethics. He was, uh, you know, one of the main promoters of that. But at the same time, he was also sceptical of most humans' ability to be um, instrumentally rational regarding ethics. So he believed as well that God's law, as it was written in the Bible, as well as God's threat of eternal punishment or eternal reward in hell or heaven, was actually a help from God, a help to humans um, to make the right choices, because though he was principally promoting rationality, he was also sceptical of humans' ability to actually be um, rational in an instrumental way. So God, in God, God's mercy, seeing that, God actually then uh, put out these uh, you know, promises of eternal uh, reward if you are ethical, and promises of eternal punishment if you're not, and that helped human beings make the right choices. 
So that's very interesting. The point I also want to make is, here was a new idea to base ethics in the dimension of rationality. And even the instigator of that idea was, I'm not sure if everyone can do this, actually. I think ideally everyone would, should be able to do this, but I'm actually not sure. So we have recourse to another idea. Maybe also with soul-making approach to ethics. It's like, yeah, ideally it would be great if everyone could be taught um, soul-making dharma, soul-making practice, um, and actually learn that. If the whole culture was so you know, radically, extravagantly, wildly different that that was the case, um, and still have the thought, hmm, not sure, not sure that everyone would be able to do that. I don't know. It's a question. So I, I think I mentioned this when we uh, just introduced the notion of rationality as a dimension, as possible dimension the other day. But um, again, drawing, drawing on Charles Taylor, he makes the distinction, I'm not sure it's his originally, but it might be, um, between two uses or, or two meanings of the word rational. There's what we might call procedural, procedural rationality and substantive or substantive rationality. So I'll just explain those briefly. Procedural is what, what I just referred to. It's the ability to use the mind, use the uh, process of logic and clear rational thinking to deduce something, to decide something. Um, there's a procedure. Rationality as a procedure, a way of using the mind. Uh, instrumental rationality. On the other hand, substantive rationality is more what someone like Plato and uh, people much earlier than John Locke really meant by rationality. It was really that there is an order to the cosmos, and human beings, to be rational means to perceive that order, perceive that hierarchy, and to conform one's being, one whole, one's whole mind and soul and heart um, and eros in correspondence with uh, that rational, that, that order of the cosmos. That's what it meant to be rational, to perceive and to uh, order one's life rationally meant, meant in correspondence with this cosmic order. So that's substantive rationality. So the word rationality has meant very different things and it's come to be used, if we say rationality as a basis, as a dimension for uh, ethics, um, it's come to be used in very different ways. So, for example, Philo of Alexandria is a very significant figure because he was the first person to combine uh, the um, Platonic philosophies with Platonic philosophy with um, the Jewish religion, and so he was actually he actually kind of disregarded in 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 the evolving stream of. Of, of Jewish theology, but in Christian theology, he, he, he was absolutely seminal. First person to kind of um, integrate those two, the Platonic and the Christian, the New Testament and the Old Testament. Sorry, the, he did the Old Testament, but later people incorporated the New Testament. Anyway, um, he said... Um, well, he thought that, you know, again, the human mind is, uh, because it's, it's, it's akin to God, it's like God's mind. So the Erigena picks up on this idea much later, but its origins are, are kind of with Philo a little bit, I think. The human mind is akin to God. It's like God because it's made in the image of uh, the divine Logos. So it's interesting in the New Testament, uh, John's Gospel begins, in the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the Word. And that idea of Logos actually comes from the Platonic thinking and comes very much from Philo. So it gets picked up. Um, I don't know who, who originated, was it? It's not quite clear where it came. Anyway, this idea of um, human being being made in the image of the divine Logos, which means the divine reason, the divine rationality. In, that's all rooted in the uh, Old Testament, in Genesis, where it says that uh, God made man uh, in the image of, of God, in the image of the divine. And uh, later in the medieval times, Maimonides interpreted it very much in a, in a, I think in a procedural way, actually. 
Um, in other words, uh, that we are given this rational functioning, and that's um, what it means to be in the in the image of the divine, made in the image of the divine. We, we can use our minds in this procedural, uh, rational way. With Philo, I think it probably meant something different. Um, it meant we are made in the image of the divine logos, the divine reason, and therefore we have, to some degree, uh, a, a capability to um, receive and uh, discover the truth about r- realities beyond time and space. In other words, about about what exists higher in the cosmic order, the, a- the angels, the intelligences, the uh, levels of divinity. So Plato, uh, Philo is using a more uh, substantive uh, notion of rationality there. So they're, they're very different. Procedural rationality, procedural meaning and substantive, very different meaning of the term rationality. But also through history you get, I think, um, times when they're often used together. When we think about soul-making dharma practice as a sort of process or guide for ethics, we think, okay, it's primarily then, in that language, primarily procedural, because we're really talking about, again, a practice or a procedure, just like using our minds logically as a kind of procedure um, that we can be trained in, um, that we have some innate capacity for, say, definitely to think logically, to, to have, you know, for the rational procedure, But we can be trained, and some people are extraordinarily trained in their ability to use uh, the rational mind in a procedural way. So we think about soul-making Dharma practice uh, as a process or guide to ethics, approach to ethics. You think, oh, it's primarily procedural, I guess, because you're doing this practice and you're you're using the practice to sort of um, support or discriminate or arrive at an ethical choice. But I guess soul making Dharma uh, practice approach could also be regarded as substantive. Um, in uh, if we if we borrow Charles Taylor's terms, if we entertain a, a logos, a conceptual framework that eros is epistemologically significant, that it has in John Milbank's uh, words, it's uh, it's ontologically disclosive. And we talked about this the other day. It's really, really important. If we entertain the idea uh, that truth is this um, journey rather than a final arriving point, and that together with other uh, navigations, Eros has epistemological significance because it can open up for us the levels of truth. It's the engine for that journey. And we're understanding truth uh, in in a participatory way as something that's create discovered rather than just discovered. So if we entertain a conceptual framework that involves a different view of eros and gives it um, a kind of a place, uh, an important place in our ontology and our epistemology, and if we think of truth in 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 this way as more of a, a journey, an infinite journey to the truth of things. And we appreciate that it's create, discovered. We participate in that. Then also we might uh, see soul-making dharma um, as substantive. As related to something that's true. But the whole notion of truth and how that relation comes about is quite... um, developed quite differently than um, one might usually think. So Oregon was um, one of the great uh, early Christian theologians, theologians, and uh, he wrote something like um, the soul of man has an intuitive longing for God. Um, actually, this is I'm quoting now from uh, someone writing about Oregon, uh, a guy called Chadwick. Uh, the soul of man has an intuitive longing for God, 
And Oregon was insistent. He won't believe that this yearning that we have, this eros that we have, can can have been somehow implanted in our, in a human being's heart and soul unless it is capable of being satisfied. And then interesting point, just as each faculty of our senses is related to a specific category of objects, so our nous, which we can translate as our um, our uh, let's call it our soul knowing. Um, is the correlate of God. So we're set up um, to move into truth, and our eros um, is actually implanted by uh, God, and it's and it wouldn't be implanted um, as divine unless it was capable of being satisfied. So again, we can translate that into soul making terms. It's never in soul making. It's never finally satisfied, but it gets satisfied on the journey, the infinite journey of soul making, the infinite journey into truth. So we are and, and this again in what he's saying, we we can have the sense, we will have the sense as we develop soul making practice of our Eros being divine, having its roots in 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 the divine, being given to us by the by the Buddha nature, by the Dharmakaya, whatever words you like. And in the movements of soul making, as the soul making dynamic opens further uh, levels, aspects, beyonds, dimensions, open, that Eros is satisfied. And then it moves again. But there's something in the infinite movement that is not unsatisfying at a deep level, but but profoundly satisfying. So again, we take uh, these ideas and they have to be understood differently, modified through the understandings and the conceptual framework of soul-making down. The procedural rationality, uh, what Taylor calls the procedural rationality, um, the Western Enlightenment assumed that that kind of rationality and a throwing off of superstitions and being natural in terms of just what was natural human pleasure, um, being natural without imposing kind of religious dogma and ideas on top, there, there was an assumption that that kind of rationality and naturality uh, would bring pleasure, happiness, and would also bring the universal good. Um, and obviously there's some, some truth to that, definitely. A lot of moral progress came from the Western Enlightenment. But um, this uh, kind of faith in that kind of rationality uh, was shaken, I think, by Freud in terms of is it actually possible for, to us, for us to really, uh, for that rationality to really rule um, in the psyche, in the psyche full of other horrors and repressions and um, uh, kind of bestial, uh, uncivilized um, impulses and movements and realities abiding in the id. So that started to question things a little bit. But by the time uh, the World War I was finished, the First World War was finished, absolute uh, carnage and devastation and um, incredible uh, uh, loss of life there. It was kind of, people started to really question whether rationality itself, uh, or rationality alone, was um, enough and whether it would just deliver pleasure, happiness, and the universal good. Um, in the Western Enlightenment uh, thinkers, it was also assumed that a disengaged rationality, that sort of stance of the scientific method, that through that, a person adopting a disengaged rationality towards their existence would obviously see the bigger picture. And in seeing the bigger picture of things, um, they would... Uh, you know, let go of their selfish interests because they can see the bigger picture. Again, there may be some some truth in that, um, but others, w- w- you know, said that no, the um, uh, tuning, turning, and tuning to nature is uh, what allows us to see a bigger picture and let go of selfish interest. 
And uh, maybe the bigger picture is only ever as big as the conceptual framework's big picture. Maybe what really will rule is the conceptual framework. And in the Enlightenment there was a certain conceptual framework of what the big picture of the universe was and what man's human being's place in that universe was. So it's the conceptual framework that will limit what the big picture is. How big the big picture is depends on how big the big picture is in the conceptual framework, more than anything. And then again, it's interesting, in the soul-making dharma we have this... uh, theory or idea that the soul-making dynamic, the dynamic of Eros Psyche Logos, um, will mean that the conceptual framework, whatever conceptual framework we, we entertain, will um, there will be a breaking of the vessels just through the expansion and the stretching of Eros that come with the, with the soul-making dynamic, the, 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 the stretching um, and uh, the walls of the structures of, of the conceptual framework and the image and the idea of things through the uh, expansion and deepening fertilization of psyche and logos and eros. There will be a breaking of the vessels, a stretching of the conceptual framework and maybe a breaking of the vessel of the conceptual framework and a new conceptual framework has to be um, create discovered, created discovered. So that's in the soul-making dharma sort of meta-conceptual framework as well. There was a lot of assumptions in the Western Enlightenment. Some of them were borne out and some of them clearly, historically, uh, were seen to be you know, misplaced or only partially valid. So, for Kant, for Immanuel Kant and others, um, human rationality was God-made, God-given and God-made, and was also, as I said, in the image of God. I think that's what Maimonides uh, took that to mean. Um, But for Kant it certainly was. Um... And human rationality was also for Kant the same as our our freedom. Our our freedom was bound up with with our being rational. We are moral, rational agents. That's our fundamental true nature. With Hegel, came a little later, um, human thought and art and and religious um, explorations and expansions uh, uh, of religions, um, human endeavor, in all that uh, are is just an expression, a movement of expression of a larger progress or movement of what could be translated as reason, what often is translated as reason. And that's a divine thing. So whether we take the Kantian view, human rationality is God made. It's part of what it, it it means to be made in the image of God, or the sort of bigger Hegelian view that human thought, human uh, rationality, human art, human religion are expressions of a larger uh, movement of kind of cosmic uh, reason developing itself, growing, expressing itself and that is a kind of divinity. So these were prevalent and uh, very powerful views but then historically what happened was um, rationality was held up as important as a, and offered as a, and assumed as a dimension for ethics, as a supporting dimension for ethics, without any reference to God. So the God bit got jettisoned, got cut off. Similarly, the notion of hierarchical order became an interconnected, or, or you know, was dismissed and replaced with an interconnected horizontal order that was designed by God and then eventually just a horizontal order without any reference to God. There's a movement through history. So just left with rationality, meaning instrumental rationality, what Taylor calls procedural rationality, our ability to think logically. 
Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, rationality which knows no principle will not raise me above the beasts. So there's this question, I think it's a very important question, is rationality, is our capacity to think logically and clearly and make deductions, is rationality sufficient as a dimension for ethics, as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a soil for ethics, as a, as a, for a, a dimension that actually provides recourse for ethical thinking and practice? Is rationality sufficient? So we still have to decide what are the aims of rationality, what our rationality is trying to judge. So is it that we're just, for example, trying to judge, as the utilitarians would say, just increase pleasure, increase something called happiness and decrease suffering, without trying to discriminate among all the varieties of happiness and suffering and put them in some order? And why? And if we say all human beings are worthy of respect, then why are we saying that? That has to be given some, uh, again, d- basis in another dimension. Why are all human beings worthy of respect? And for Kant, it was because human beings are, that's the true nature of human beings, if they're rational, and that's God-given, and that's in the image of God. And rationality itself had this kind of, um, you know, almost semi numinous quality. It was something o- almost holy. It was a thing for Kant almost of another dimension. So we need some kind of uh, metaphysics. I don't know. Would people have that view of rationality today? That it's uh, a kind of divinity or divine dimension or even a higher dimension. Just our ability to be logical. Is that enough grounding for ethics? Do we need... um, Does ethics need a kind of... uh, a better or a more sophisticated or a more um, powerful or more convincing met- metaphysics, you know. For example, um, why are all human beings worthy of respect? Because of the spark of divinity in them, because of the Buddha nature that they embody, carry, express, because they are theophanies, whatever it is. But anyhow, The question I really have is, is rationality sufficient as a dimension? Because nowadays we think of rationality uh, in a a different way than Kant and Hegel. And even Locke, who made it something thinner than Kant and Hegel, that came before them, um, uh, still had to say, well, okay, but there's there's this other level of uh, of God as well pointing. If we've lost all that, do we not need a better metaphysics? to justify why are all human beings worthy of respect? Why are all human beings equally worthy of respect? How are we going to ground that? So again, as I said in the Sino Soul Talks, thing, you know, someone like Richard Rorty, Rorty will try not to have dimensions very hard. They're absolutely ruled out, you know, flatly and explicitly. There's no recourse to any other level of explanation or meaning or dimension or anything like that. But he ends up um, kind of talking in circles or betraying himself because he actually, you can, his writing slips and he betrays um, himself in that. It's it's impossible not to. So we still, I think, I think, I wonder, is rationality sufficient? I'm not sure. We still need some kind of metaphysics. Even if it's a metaphysics of the numinosity of rationality. Somehow. But then that implies a dimensionality that uh, perhaps even suggests another dimension, you know. So again, soul-making now will provide, does provide, um, other metaphysics, other uh, groundings, other dimensions, but but in an, an ontologically novel way. So we had voluntarism, we had cosmic order, we had rationality, and the other one was just the view that 
we ground ethics just in, in, in the simple idea of reducing suffering and uh, increasing pleasure and something called happiness. Reducing suffering. And so that's a very, you know, that sounds very Buddhist. These other ideas sound um, much of it's only voluntarism, the Buddha said, um, is, is still, you know, active um, for some people. But, you know, volunt- but cosmic order and rationality, not really. But a lot of Buddhists would just, that's how they would just, that's the most important thing. That's what guides ethics. That's where we're grounding ethics, just in a fundamental principle of reducing suffering. So let's look at this one. Um, you know, again, there were some assumptions here. Um, Adam Smith, regarded as the, the father of modern economics, but was the father of capitalist economics, uh, he and others assumed a potential harmony of interests. If everyone just pursues, um, if everyone just uh, simply tries to increase their happiness, um, increase their pleasure, then society and economy will structure itself um, in a mutually beneficial way. Because there's a potential harmony of interest between human beings. So, I don't know if everyone agrees with that. There's, again, certain ways it could be true. I'm not sure what Karl Marx would think. Um, And there's ways we can see, well, mm, that really doesn't work. It's not true. Sociologically speaking, economically speaking, politically speaking. But in terms of ethics as well, what about antinomies? which are defined as exactly not a harmony of interest, but a conflict of ethical pools, conflict between values, whether that's within a person or between two people or groups or whatever it is. And what about hierarchical comparisons? Even more important. There's this complete flattening with this kind of view of any kind of uh, um, means to evaluate or create, uh, or discover, or create a sense of hierarchy and uh, hierarchical comparison between different kinds of suffering, different kinds of pleasure, different kinds of happiness. So, um, if we say, you know, suffering is the most important thing, uh, sorry, reducing suffering is the most important thing, that's our compass, that's our purpose, that's the highest value. That's all we need to think about in terms of ethics. So a lot of Buddhists would, if if you push them, they would they would say something like that. And I say, well, why? Why is reducing suffering the highest value? Why is that the compass, the purpose, the most important thing? Because as it was pointed out uh, in the last talk and previously in the Sila and Soul talks, it depends on on the view of suffering, which depends on on uh, ontologies and all kinds of things. So, for example, if I'm a staunch materialist, then actually it's hard for me to justify um, this this idea that reducing suffering is important. Because really, what suffering is, is just a kind of... Um, it has no reality in itself. It's just the movement of particles in the in the universe, just like anything else is. So, again... Reducing suffering, making that the highest value, or increasing pleasure, increasing happiness, um, I I have to base that in something else, in another level of ontology, another dimension. I have to justify it somehow. It also doesn't really help. Like reducing suffering, it seems, okay, that's simple. It's really simple. That's my compass in life. That's what I do as a Buddhist, perhaps, or whatever. That's how I decide things. But it it often won't do, won't help very much at all in deciding what to do in a situation. If I do this, this much suffering will follow. If I do that, that much suffering will follow. But actually, we need an infinite kind of arithmetic. Who the hell is going to know? the full consequences as they as they play out in 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 the web of of uh, existence and this affects that and that condition affects that condition and this incoming condition affects how that condition progresses or not or what it affects 
there's an infinite arithmetic uh, required to, to, to then discern which action in, in many, many cases. And I think even more importantly, what about this question of hierarchy of suffering? There's certainly this infinite calculation that's needed that's kind of impossible. But what about this hierarchy of suffering? We still need to acknowledge um, a, a hierarchy, even if it's just individually determined. It's this person's hierarchy. This suffering feels worse to bear. This suffering has not so much impact as that kind of suffering. Even if it's individually determined, we still need to acknowledge that there is a hierarchy and somehow have a way of sorting through the various kinds of suffering. What about the sufferings of meaninglessness? What about the suffering of a lack of soulfulness in life, of soullessness? What about the suffering of having a sense that I'm not really doing my duty? I have no idea what my duty is, or I do know what it is and I'm just not doing it. How does that measure up in the hierarchy with physical pain as suffering or with dying early and having a relatively short life or not being able to go on holiday how do we demarcate delineate as measure there is hierarchy even if it's personal so I think I think this one we really need to think a little harder if we just if that's what we say it's just it's just about reducing suffering. You know Jeremy Bentham who pr- promoted utilitarianism this this idea it's just just about maximizing happiness pleasure minimizing uh, unpleasant. So that kind of idea and and it can be certain interpretations of Buddha Dharma. Um, uh, it's just about reducing suffering. It's just very, very simple like that. That's the, the kind of view that's held and the, and the answer that will be given, whether it's just the self-suffering or self and others in a kind of more Mahayana, supposedly Mahayana kind of view. So the interpretations of what reducing suffering means and what the moti- motivations are um, you know, involved in reducing suffering, reducing the unpleasant, as this is what human beings want, just reduce the unpleasant Vedana, reduce suffering, increase the pleasant Vedana. This is a, a kind of small, flat psychology. It won't do, it's too poor. And the idea that we can kind of um, successfully compute um, uh, that the kind of... M- m- Massive, successfully compute that, that kind of uh, total suffering from one choice and total suffering from another choice. Sort of um, massive, impossible project of one dimensional arithmetic. It just doesn't really stand up. So, with, with the Western Enlightenment, there was. Um, a very strong current within it, utility only, meaning people desire, basic natural desire, it's normal natural uh, desire for people to, to desire, you know, pleasant, pleasant pleasure and happiness and the absence of pain. And, and then any conception of the order of things is completely irrelevant. Only the consequences in terms of pleasure and pain. That's what was important. There was was almost not a slogan, but something like that. Utility only. Nothing about cosmic order or or anything like that. Just the consequences in terms of pleasure and pain. How can we maximize pleasure and something called happiness? How can we minimize pain and, and unpleasant? Actually, this, that whole philosophy and that whole ethical philosophy is, is really a, a, an attempt at a, a non-dimensionalizing. There's no dimensionality there. Okay. Uh, so I'm not even sure whether I should have included it, but it's, ac- it's actually a non-dimensionalizing, I'm including it because a lot of people think that way. But the very um, sense we have of a hierarchy of sufferings even again, even if it's individual, if mine isn't the same as yours, the sense we have of a hierarchy of sufferings 
implies, it suggests, it hints, it points at some kind of dimensionality. Some kind of um, ordering of values. And utilitarianism completely ignores that. Completely ignores any possible relative um, hierarchizing of values. And if things are in a hierarchy, it's because they're rooted in, in, in uh, they somehow correspond uh, to a dimensionality. The sense of a hierarchy of sufferings itself hints at, it points to, it suggests. You know, in, um, you may have heard a teaching in, in the Buddha Dharma, it's I think fairly common, um, is uh, you're, you realize you're, you're falling. You're falling uh, without a parachute through space. Oh my, oh my goodness, ah, you know, massive dukkha, falling. Then at some point you notice there is no ground. There's no ground. I'm just falling, but there's no ground. Therefore, there's no problem, because I'm not going to smash into something and die. So falling, but there's no ground. And often that's given as a teaching, sometimes it's, I think, given as a teaching on emptiness or groundlessness, but uh, actually when you go into what's being taught there, it's more a teaching about impermanence. But either way, that doesn't matter. I want to get to something else here. What if, what if the meaning, the highest meaning in life was to recognize that there is no ground, so there is no problem, so there's no suffering? And maybe, if you want, you can add um, that to help and show others that um, so they realize there's no problem. If that's the highest meaning in life, to recognize that there's no ground, so there's no problem, therefore there's no suffering for yourself, and then to show others, to help others see there's no ground, so no problem, so no suffering. How does that sit with you? So just imagine that. So just people falling through space, really afraid, then realizing there's no ground, and then explaining that to each other. So eventually, everyone is just falling through space, and not without uh, and, and without without a sense of problem, without dukkha. And just linger with that as the highest meaning of life moving towards that vision. That moving towards that vision is the highest purpose in life. Just imagine these beings falling through empty space, but um, none have a problem with it. That's the goal. How does that sit with you? What I, want to, what, I, what I want to say here is, is if, you, if you feel called to defend uh, this view of the meaning of life, the meaningfulness of life, as um, reducing suffering and helping others to reduce their suffering, look closer. Just look closer. Is this goal of, you know, for example, realizing there's nothing to do, nowhere to go, and then there's the no suffering that we're just falling through space just falling through space but there's no problem we help each other see there's no problem is this goal of not suffering helping others see no suffering what I want to ask is if you look closer if you linger with it and look closer doesn't it have some other appeal to for example when we're not worrying about the falling, when we just realize that we're just falling, going nowhere, nothing to do, no problem, 
then we sense the beauty or the radiance or the Buddha nature or the holiness if you don't like that word, the mystery but the appeal of the less suffering and help, help others to, to suffer less has something that's hiding behind it that's not being articulated that is hidden You might have to stay with that a little longer. But um, this is one of the sort of central sort of uh, contentions, insistencies, explorations, theses of soul-making dharma. There's something often unexpressed, unarticulated, hiding behind uh, the view we have, the conceptual framework we have of Buddha Dharma, for example, the way we explain it to ourselves and to others, that's not quite fully uh, illuminated, or fully even self-honest, let's say. And Soul Making Dharma tries to expose that and point out there's something hiding behind it, there's something that's not being articulated here, usually. Or at least that it needs another level. It needs something more than the ending of suffering. Even if that's the ending of suffering for all beings. So, uh, this is one of uh, the, the areas where soul making dharma comes in and tries to um, open things out. Give, um, give more of what might be needed. Offer more of what might be needed. So voluntarism, sense of the order of the cosmos, rationality, decreasing suffering, increasing happiness. Um, these are some of the ideas, some of the ways, the sort of dimensionality or uh, rooting of ethics has been offered, and the varieties of them through history, and again, just using, using them as a sort of... Uh, framework really to understand something, open something up, see what soul making dharma uh, and, and practice can offer into this question of um, uh, ethical philosophy and practice and, uh, and the dimensionality that's needed there dimensionality that we need to ground and root our ethics Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.